they are and what they're doing. And we want to be able to know that, but also know that it isn't our fault that this is the way it is. I had a teacher, Mr. Reeves, that pulled me up out of my seat when I was 13, I think, or 14, and you know, yelled at me because my last name uh, was the same name as my previous brothers and sisters who had been in his class. And he didn't like them. So he immediately assumed he didn't like me and pulled me out of my you know, but that wasn't my fault that I was named Clement. It wasn't my fault that Mr. Reeves was nasty, right? Uh, even though I began to form ideas about myself, that there's something wrong with me. When indeed there wasn't anything wrong. Um, so we want to learn that things are not our fault, even though we go through some difficult things. This brain that we have, this wonderful brain, monitors everything. It's watching us all the time, and it says, oh, this means this. And, you know, if you're doing that, you should be shameful. If you're doing this, you're guilty. Um, and sometimes, oh, you did a good job, and we'll get an applause, right? Or you're doing okay. So we really need to pay attention to the tricky brain and just, just what is it doing, right? How does it work? Um, we only have, you know, such a short time today, so I, I don't want to go in depth to these things. You can find these things out. All you got to do is go on YouTube, look up Dr. Paul Gilbert, Compassion Focus Therapy, and watch his videos, <laughs> you know, instead of me going through all of that, right? But it is something, this is magnificent, our brain, and what it can do um, in the present moment. All potential is possible. It's, uh, but getting into the present moment and staying there is sometimes difficult, because our tricky brain likes to talk about the past, or our tricky brain likes to talk about the future. <laughs> and so it bounces back and forth between past and future, past and future, or at least to talk about us and tell us, you know, some of you probably not, maybe not, all right, let's see. How many of you have what they call a harsh critical voice in your head? Yeah. Talks to you, says things to you, it's not very nice from time to time, right? That kind of thing, that also is not a fault. <laughs> it's how our brain has evolved and the way we then talk to be, right? Uh, yes, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. So if we have these harsh critical voices in our heads, about someone else, is that different or essentially the same as having it about ourselves and are the two connected? Well, yeah, that is a very good question. And I'd say the two are connected, that this is sort of a mirror, right? And so if I have a judgment against you, I have a judgment against myself. If I'm critical about you, I'm more likely critical. I have a critical voice in my head about myself. So if we are hearing this critical voice in our head about someone else, the fact that we're hearing the same words, whether can the brain differentiate if it's about us or about them? Well, I think you can differentiate whether it's about them or about I think it's about them, but my brain is hearing this stuff run, so am I kind of like getting a dose of it myself if I'm trying to pour it out to somebody else? That's, that's well, you, you would. You would get a dose of it yourself if you're hearing it in your own in your own mind, and you would get uh, some of the di different chemicals that the brain releases uh, as you're, you know, like say you're saying you're angry about somebody else, uh, you know, yeah. across the room. Yeah. So you're you're projecting anger onto them, right? And inside yourself, you're feeling adrenaline, cortisol, and dopamine. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're really unhappy inside, but we might not notice it because we're projecting the anger over there. So we're not noticing what's happening right here. That's exactly what I was asking. So we want to, ultimately, we can do one of two things. We can project things like that, or we can extend. And extension is usually uh, more preferable, because it's from our heart. It's from projection. Extend. One more time, project or extend. Yeah, projection is where you're putting it out there externally. Extension is it's coming from you to them. You're, you're bringing love or compassion or kindness or forgiving that's forgiving from you, through you, extending it out to those around you. Does that make sense? Um, I'm wondering, could I not project all of that out to us because I'm a loving person, I want to project out love? Is right. the same thing? I mean, yeah, yeah, I know. It seems like it would be... Project it out. I'm, I'm curious mm -hmm. about extending and projecting. Right, 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 right. It seems like... Projection is the same as extension. Yes. So if you just play with the two words, okay. you can kind of begin to feel, get a felt sense of what extension is versus projection is usually about blame, judgment, shame, okay. putting it 
on someone else, trying to get rid of it by going, oh, let me do it over there. But it doesn't go anywhere. I'll add the last question, because I don't want to take up too much time, but is there some legitimate sense if someone is doing something that aggravates you, is your response always coming from your need to project, or could you just genuinely say, this doesn't work for me? What's the healthy way? And this may go beyond the scope of what you're saying. Uh -huh. just, that's, that's all. I think you get the right to choose what is the healthy way, right? What feels good for you inside, you know? Um, for me, am I being loving, kind, and caring? And if I'm not doing that, then I'm not doing it. That's, that's just my rule, you yeah. know? But everybody gets to form their own rules of what you want to be about in the moment that you're alive. In the moment that I'm alive, which is now, I want to be about being kind, caring, and loving to her, to her, myself, my body, mind, and to everyone else around me. But it took me a long time to get there. I didn't know that for probably uh, 60 years. <laughs> because 60 years, I did projection. I would blame people. I would judge them. I would look at them, you know, and then I would do it to myself, too, of course. I would judge myself. You know, I'd say, oh, she's really pretty, but I'm not. Or, oh, she's got really good shape, but I don't. So I would do these kind of things, and I was not aware that I was doing them, or that my brain, let me put it that way, my brain was doing them. And I wasn't aware. I thought that. Basically, I thought that was me. I don't have those ideas anymore. Uh, I know that my thinking brain is not who I am, and much, much more than that. So uh, but our brains are important. So this is my way of showing you the tricky brains. The bottom brain there is a reptile or a little lizard. I use these in my groups uh, in training. <laughs> the middle brain is a mammal. That's a, a mammal part of our brain that is what makes us so that we're kind and caring and take care of our children and take care of uh, elderly uh, family members, people who are sick. It has to do with that mammal brain. Uh, and we are really the only ones that do that as far as a species. So our other species, like monkeys, they will take care of their young. And uh, tigers will, lions will, you know, those, they will take care of their young, but they don't take care of their elderly, and they don't take care of anybody who's ill. We are the only species that does that, and that has to do with the way our brain has evolved. And then, of course, on top is the cerebral cortex, or your thinking brain, the brain that uses the word I, me, my, mine. I want this, this is mine, this is important, it's all about me, and these things are mine, right? So we want to pay attention to the thinking brain that is also talking in our head. What is it saying? What direction is it taking me? Or, let's see, I smoked 378,462 cigarettes. Why? Because my brain said that many times, I want a cigarette. I need a cigarette. And all of a sudden, you know, after 35 years, and all walking into the possibility of COPD, I began to say, what's going on here? And I began to learn about what my brain was doing that was creating my behaviors. And so to change the brain or change your mind changes the behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, when I shared you the story about uh, walking off Skid Row, what happened there, from my perspective, was I had an epiphany. And that epiphany rewired my brain. And it did it in a nanosecond. And so all the other ideas that I had previously about going down to the bar and hanging out with these people and how much fun it was and how getting drunk was fun, all that was gone and erased. And so my behaviors completely changed because I didn't have those thoughts anymore. They were just erased somehow. So I really like the face. <laughs> Pretty good if we could generate them, a few of them, right? Um, uh, just a slight example of an epiphany that happened for a client that came in yesterday. Young man, 21 years of age, with uh, anger problems and projecting everything out, blaming people. Couldn't deal with it. If somebody said, uh, you know, you're acting strange, then he would blame it on others. The interesting thing was, I noticed when I went in the hallway that he was uh, licking his lips constantly and chewing on them, and you know, so I just noticed that. When he came into the room and we began to talk about what's going on, he continued to do that. He continued to lick his lips and chew on them. So finally I asked, I said, you know, is 
they're helping you. Why are you doing that? He said, well, my lips are dry. I said, oh, your lips are dry. Yeah, yeah, they're dry. He said, oh, and, and that's helping? Well, no, that's making my lips chapped. I said, oh, and he said, and in fact, my lips are really, really chapped. I said, oh, well, you don't want chapped lips? Well, no, I don't. Now, remember, he's 21. No, I don't want chapped lips. I said, oh, OK, you don't want chapped lips. I got that, you know. Well, yeah, but I got to lick them. I, I, I really want to lick them. I said, no, you don't. You just told me <laughs> that you don't want to lick them. Oh, yeah, I did, didn't I? OK. Yeah, you're right. I don't want to lick my lips. I said, OK, so don't do that. And he said to me, I can do that? I said, of course you can do that. You, you can choose to lick them or not. He didn't lick them again. It completely stopped right then and there. And of course, at the end, I handed him some chaps. <laughs> I said, this might help. Carry it in your pocket. Right? <laughs> and, and so for him, in that moment, you know, he was really empowered that he could do something like that. And it surprised him. And the, the way the body felt about, oh, I got to lick him. The urge to lick his lips. He could feel that. He became in touch with that urge. And also, the empowerment of, oh, I can stop doing this. So my hope is, and I'll see how he does next week when he comes in, that this generalizes over into other things, right? If you can stop doing that, maybe you can stop doing anger. Maybe you can stop blaming and judging and doing what he's doing. Because it isn't working for him. So those are, to me, that's a fantastic thing. And I got to learn, I got to watch this happen in front of my own eyes. You know, just, oh, okay, I'm going to do it. And he was successful. Uh, these are the three circles. <coughs> this right here is the same thing as my three little puppets that I use, right? Uh, in compassion-focused therapy, we talk about uh, a threat-focused system, which is right back here in the base, uh, right here in the back of our mind. Um, and it uh, can get us so that we feel anxious, um, disgust, anger. We want to fight. Uh, we want to freeze, which you talked about earlier uh, today. And then we have the seeking system or the drive system, which makes us want to go and get a job and do these various things, achieve various things. And we have the content safe uh, system that likes to connect with things. Uh, and in CFT, they call it the soothing system. So you have uh, your drive system, which is turned on, and you're all here. You're driven here, I don't, I don't mean physically with your car, but you wanted to come here for some reason. And uh, for most of us, the drive system and the threat system are the two systems that are activated most of the time. The soothing system, uh, for most people, is not on board. But we know threat, and we know, uh, I gotta do it, I gotta do it. So we're kind of like a hamster on a wheel with a running of adrenaline, cortisol, and dopamine going through us a lot which affects how the brain functions and it affects what we're doing. So in compassion focused therapy, the idea is, is how do we engage the, sooth the soothing system? And so I'm just going to throw in a little bit of um, something that I teach people is in that back here is where your what they call the reptilian brain or the old brain is right back here and it gets activated and gets fearful. So one of the things we can do, right, is actually take our hand and put it right there in the back of our head. And the other hand, right here on the drive system, and we can re we can repeat, be at ease, be at ease, be calm. It's relaxing. Take a breath, everything is fine. And the brain itself, when you do that, will begin to release itself. It will begin to come out of that. And just do that for a moment. May I be at peace, may I be at ease. Everything is okay. Just notice how that feels. It's a very simple procedure. And you can sort of take your hand across your forehead. And just wipe away any kind of thoughts that might be inhibiting you from being who you are in the moment. Come back to How did that work for you? Do you feel the difference, the calming nature that comes over us? And we can do that even when we're in a crisis mode or when we're angry. We can just consciously say,
consciously. So we're doing it consciously. We're not doing things unconsciously. When we're working from these three brains, and this is, for me, what's really important, is the three brains. This is Dan Siegel's uh, definition. This would be your spine. This would be your reptilian brain. This would be your mammal. And this would be your thinking brain. So these three brains are working automatically. They are on autopilot. And they work independently of us. Uh, your three brains will never say, hey, Vern, what do you think? Should we attack now or later? <laughs> <laughs> they just won't do that. They won't do it. They're on autopilot. And they will do as they see fit, what they determine is the best behavior in the moment. Fortunately for us, if we're consciously aware of this, we can influence the three brains in a different direction. So if we notice that the brain is going in a direction or it's giving us thoughts about going in a direction that's not in line with our values or what's important to us, we can actually pivot in that moment and go in another way, go in a, go in a different direction. Uh, Steve Hayes, in fact, was um, one of the founders of ACT, is coming out with a new book called Pivot uh, and just, just how to do it. You know, basketball stars are great at pivoting. <laughs> Right? But we want to learn to pivot in our brain, pivot in our mind. That takes being consciously aware and awake, right? kind of thing. Um, so those are the three circles. Again, you can learn more about that on, uh, well, let me go back to those for a minute. I have a great son-in-law, Robert Robinson. He said to me today, yesterday, we were talking about the three circles. And he said, yeah, it's like a three-ring circus. <laughs> You've got the elephants in one, the guy with the tiger in another, and he says, I'm sitting there going like this. Oh my god, oh my god, you know. And the top told me caught up, right? And that's what happens for most of us. We get caught up in the three brains and what the three brains are doing. So want to notice if you've got a three-ring circus going on, who's the guy that whip? <laughs> Also, that can lead us into what's called distracted living, where we're, uh, we know we feel bad, things are not working for us, so we use television, uh, play with our phones, gaming, and of course, because we're in substance abuse, we know we also use, we drink, <laughs> we hurt ourselves, we use drugs, sometimes we cut ourselves, eating disorders, all of that is a way to be distracted from what's going on right where you're sitting, right where you're standing. And from my perspective, the best thing is to become aware of what's going on and then ask the question, what now? What shall I do now? This is happening. Uh, the other night, my brain laying in bed 12 o'clock at night, and my mind went into a scenario that someone was being harmed, one of my family members. So what would you think was the experience that I went into with my brain creating a scene that somebody in my family was being harmed? Angst, right? I got anxious. I felt all this, these chemicals in my body. And I said, oh, look at that. Let's see, it's midnight. You're laying in bed. Where'd you get the information that somebody's being harmed? <laughs> oh, from my brain. That's where I got that. OK, I think um, I'll uh, choose to think about something else. Or I'll choose to practice my breath. Uh, my breathing, this kind of thing. And within a few moments, I was back to being empty. There was no more fear, no anxiety. But that again means we have to be conscious of what's going on right where we are, right in our body mind, right in the present moment, without distracting ourselves in another way. Uh, this here, compassionate mental states, um, learning that we can understand compassion as a flow, and when, they, when they're saying compassion as a flow, again, this is Paul Gilbert's work, uh, CFT, compassion to others, uh, open, uh, begin being open to compassion coming from others to us, right? And then uh, compassion towards ourself. Those, those, that's what they consider the compassion flow. Can I get good at doing that? See, the idea is if we can have a voice in our head that's critical towards us, if we can create a character in our brain that says, this is who I am, uh, we can also create a compassionate other within ourselves. And I just want to give an example of that. Uh, somewhere in December, about, it was seven degrees above zero. It was dark. It was nine o'clock at night. I got out of my car. I did things backwards. 
I had some idea in my head. I 